Okay, welcome to Eric's Perspective. Joining us today at M. Hanks Gallery is Paul Von Blum, Senior Lecturer at UCLA in uh, African American Studies and Communication Studies and uh, author of eight books. Paul, thanks for coming. Welcome. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, you know I love to talk, so this is just another opportunity to talk. <laughs> Excellent. So we'll do it. Okay, so let's just have a little chat. You know, okay. So starting first with, uh, you've authored a couple of different books on African American art. I was just curious to know, how did you get attracted to the subject of African American art? Now, I have been involved with the African American community pretty much my entire life. It stems very much from my family background. I think you know some of the stories, but I'm happy to uh, talk to you about it. Oh, please, please. My parents were politically active uh, my entire life. I come from a political active, politically active family. Um, my parents were involved in 1957 in breaking the color line in Levittown, Pennsylvania. That was my earliest involvement in the civil rights movement. It's something that I talk about in my class and that I've written about in my memoir. Mm -hmm. In 1957, uh, we were living in Levittown, Pennsylvania, which was an all-white suburb, uh, one of those so-called sundown towns. And my parents and a couple of other white families realized that uh, that was horrible. And so in 1957, they helped a black family named the Myers moved in. They knew that there was going to be trouble. I was the oldest then of uh, four. Mm -hmm. Fifth came along later when we moved to California. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had no idea that it would be absolutely horrible. When the Myers moved in, we had mobs of people. I mean, in fact, inspired by the Ku Klux Klan. Now, this is north of Philadelphia. Oh, my God. This is Pennsylvania. Wow. Uh, and the night that they moved in, uh, an enormous mob gathered uh, calling uh, everybody including us, nigger lover, nigger lover, nigger lover. And I use that language because it was real, and oh, I'm yeah. not afraid to use it. Uh, <laughs> that night, uh, it took the governor of uh, the state, George Leader, to send out uh, the national, well, he's, he took out the um, Pennsylvania State Police to break it up. But for weeks afterwards, uh, a group called the Levittown Betterman Committee uh, had caravans of cars uh, waving Confederate flags. Uh, that was in August 1957. And in September 1957, they burned a cross on our lawn. And that oh, was, wow. in fact, inspired by the Ku Klux Klan. I was a witness to it at about 3.30 or 4 in the morning. I saw them leave. Uh, to fast forward a little bit, uh, it was a pretty horrendous time, but I wound up testifying in December 1957 against the Ku Klux Klan, my earliest involvement in civil rights, way back in 1957. So how, how old were you then? I was 14. Wow. Uh, and I was, uh, a test, I was a witness. I testified against the leaders of the Betterman Committee, including a man named Jim Newell. I stood up in court and I identified him as the person who called me and others nigger lover. Uh, uh, again, to fast forward, uh, my family was ostracized. My father lost a number of jobs. Uh, it was, as I explained to my students, the end of uh, kind of the tail end of McCarthyism. Oh, wow. Uh, my family and a couple of the other families were basically blacklisted. And uh, in short, we had to move to California in order to uh, get away from that kind of blacklisting. Was uh, there was there any uh, time when uh, you guys were under threat of violence? I mean, they did often. Yeah, often. Were you uh, were you ever physically attacked? Uh, I was physically attacked. My younger brother was physically attacked. Uh, I was ostracized in the uh, neighborhood. Um, and what about the black family? They must have been subjected to a lot of horrendous uh, terrorist type uh, activities. They withheld uh, the uh, terror, the threats, and they stood their ground and they made it. Uh, like the African Americans in the South, they were the true heroes. And I try to explain to my students, uh, people like me were supporting actors. 
uh, when we came to California uh, to kind of rebuild our lives, uh, I was still in high school. But by the time I got to college, I knew I had to continue the struggle. Uh, at that point, I knew I had to be one of those people who went south. So I was one of those kids uh, who went to the south. I went to uh, Georgia. Uh, I joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, and early on, I in SNCC, uh, I started going into the uh, sit-ins, those kind of classic sit-ins. Uh, what was interesting was that uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, I sat in at a place called Charlie Lebb's Restaurant. And it was 1962 where I was at the same set of demonstrations with one of the most wonderful people I've ever met, Congressman John Lewis, who is now in the fight for his life. Yeah. And we all hope that he makes it. Yeah. It's possible. It's right. possible. We want him to make it. Oh, of course. But I uh, spent uh, much of the next several years, even while I was a student, uh, intermittently going south. So uh, when, you, when you were in south, I mean, how, how did you feel? Did you feel afraid? Were you looking over your shoulder? I mean, how, how were you on a personal level? How, how was that? I was sometimes afraid, but when you're 19 and 20, uh, you don't quite have the same apprehension of fear that you do when you're older. <laughs> it's not like I was reckless. I right. was never reckless, but I never had the same sense of fear <laughs> right. that you get later. Yeah. It's It really was. I was not reckless, uh, but uh, when you're younger, you do things yeah. uh, because you're committed to it. Uh, we took steps. We were uh, we took caution, but I was so committed to this struggle. It has been the struggle of my life. Huh. I've been political in a wide variety of other ways, but during my undergraduate years, this is what I was doing. Uh, I was in California. I was doing it here. When you say California, was that all the time in the Los Angeles area? No, no. We actually were in San Diego. Okay. Uh, and as an undergraduate, I went to San Diego State. Oh. Uh, but I told my professors, I'm going to be away for two weeks, three weeks. Uh, I'm happy to do my assignments. And in one memorable time, I wrote a political science um, term paper sitting on, I don't remember what restaurant. Uh, I actually wrote it while we were having a sit-in. I wrote it in hand. <laughs> uh, and I mailed it back. Uh, in an envelope with stamps. My do you, students do, don't know how to do that today. <laughs> right. Do you recall what grade you got on it? I got an A. Excellent. I was good at it. You deserve an A just yes. for the effort part of it. Doing it. <laughs> uh, but I was in uh, I was in Georgia. I was in uh, the, the most dangerous places were in Alabama. We yeah. were in Montgomery. We were arrested. I tell my students it's true. I was arrested uh, on the road uh, allegedly for uh, a holdup in a gas station. I, we were... Uh, Charged with armed robbery. Oh boy! You've known me for years. I'm not an armed robber. No, uh, I don't. You were do the last guns. person I was ex expecting. Uh, to be so we were taken to the, uh, to the Montgomery jail. Oh wow! Battered around a little bit and released. Uh, how, how long are you in the um, jail? Several hours. And then they kicked us. Uh, that was common in the civil right. rights movement. It's an intimidation tactic. That's exactly right. what it is. Yeah. Uh, so we, we we you know we paid our dues. We were there. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember which year we did which. You know, a lot of people, I've been, uh, I've, I've had a number of oral histories, and my memory is very good, but I don't recall which year and which place. I was at the March on Washington when Dr. King gave his speech. I know that. Well, my mother was there too, by the way. Sister. Fan yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. No, um, Bernie Sanders was there. Yeah. You know, I tell my students I was looking. He said, Bernie, Bernie, where are you? But I couldn't find him. Uh, you know, I can't know all the people who were there. No, there's tons of people that were there. 250,000 people. Which, was a, which was, a good, was a good thing. I mean, it was a good show of support for for a worthy a worthy cause. No it question. was one of the most memorable days in my life. Yeah, absolutely. And I had been involved in the movement before. And I remember Dr. King saying, we'll do this together. We'll go to jail together. And yeah. I did. Yeah. I went back to Alabama. I went uh, to New Orleans, one of my favorite cities. I got beaten up on uh, Canal Street. Oh, Not no. badly. Oh, boy. You know, I had nonviolent training. Yeah. You know, a couple of thugs beat me up. I love telling the story to my guest students. A couple of thugs beat me up. Phoebe Beasley did a wonderful um, picture. It's in my book. 
and it holds up a uh, sign that says, don't buy where you can't work. Right. It's a magnificent um, painting. I held that same sign, not the one that she painted, uh, but, but I held that sign I, on Canal Street and two white thugs came and knocked me to the ground. Oh, boy. Uh, but we were committed to nonviolence. Yeah. Uh, and I never fought back because that's what we did. And they didn't hurt me badly. I knew how to do self-defense. So what happened was that after five minutes, they got frustrated. Uh, these thugs didn't know what to do with somebody not fighting back. Right. And two New Orleans cops watched the whole thing. Watched and when I finally thing. got up, the two New Orleans cops came and said to the two thugs who beat me up, are you hurt? To the thugs. To the thugs. <laughs> How uh, do you want to press charges? And as I love to tell my students, apparently I injured their feet with my ribs. <laughs> no, but that was also very typical in the movement. Yeah. Uh, and I just kept doing stuff like that. I was uh, in, uh, you know, I was mostly not in Mississippi, although I talked to people. But I, I want to reiterate, uh, I was just a supporting actor. The real heroes were the African Americans in the South. They had to stay. Yeah, they lived it. They lived it. I could go back uh, and become a university student again. And in 1964, I graduated from college, and I knew that I wanted to continue. I wasn't just going to stop with a BA. Right. And so I applied for and was accepted uh, to the PhD program in political science at Berkeley. I really wanted to be in Berkeley. And Berkeley was where everything was happening. I had done civil rights movement in Los Angeles, even while I was an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. We had picketed Vandy Camp's Ber uh, bakery here yeah. uh, in the L.A. area, uh, some other places. Uh, but I was in San Diego. I actually went earlier on my birthday, my 21st birthday on March 30th, 1943. Uh, 1964, and CORE, the uh, Congress of Racial Equality, mm -hmm. had sent me to Phoenix, and we organized a huge set of demonstrations in uh, the Capitol, and I and a few other people occupied the governor's office in uh, the state capitol, and we were taken out by, uh, I think, you know, it was four highway patrolmen. Uh, physically, physically, physically removed you. One on each arm, one on each leg. <laughs> so you you were just carried away. Yes, and wow. the one the one of the police officers deposited me uh, on the grounds of the state capitol, and then looked at me and said, "I'm going to use the language that he used." He said, "If I see you again uh, in the governor's office, I'm going to beat the shit out of you." Mm. And I love to tell my students that it was an honest comp. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, good Lord. That's, because we rushed but the... But he's a police officer and he's talking to you in that manner. We rushed the, off, the governor's office again and we reoccupied it. This is on my birthday, so it's one of those dates that I remember. Uh, Did you encounter that same police officer? Same officer. Did and he beat the crowd? Yes, this time he took me behind a police car and when nobody was looking, he punched me in the face. Oh my goodness. And I don't know, a few months later, he cracked the roots of my bottom teeth and they had to be removed. Oh, wow. So, uh, but... I, was there any... Did you do anything about it? There's I mean, nothing I could do. Uh, it would be... It would be pointless to bring a... Totally. A legal action against him. His word against mine. And right. That's why would, he took you, just the two of you behind. Yes. Who would they believe? Yeah, right, right. So... So, so did you finish your PhD at uh, no. UC Berkeley? No. No, because you ended up becoming a lawyer, though. In San Diego, in uh, on June 26th, there are days that I remember. Uh, but I also tell my students I was in the moment. I didn't record everything, right? Uh, and we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have any of that paraphernalia, right? Right. Uh, so on uh, June 26th, I had just graduated with my BA, and I was going to go to Berkeley. I was arrested at the Bank of America, and. And for what? For a series of demonstrations against the discriminatory hiring policies. They wouldn't hire African Americans. You mean at the bank? Except for menial positions. Right. That was one of the few times that I had a marginal leadership role. I helped to organize those. Mm -hmm. I got arrested, taken to jail, released, 
brought to trial. Uh, the trial was a joke. I was convicted in an hour along with a few other defendants. Of what? I was of oh, trespassing. I was also contempt of court because we violated uh, an injunction. Uh, I was the one who was chosen to testify. I'm verbal. Yeah. I'm not fearful. Right. And uh, after uh, the jury rendered the verdict, the judge asked me to stand up. And for about 10 minutes, uh, he basically excoriated me. He told me that I was nothing more than a common criminal. And I was no different from anybody else who was ever convicted of a crime. Wow. And he sent me to the probation department for pre-sentence investigation the probation officer then sat me down these are very memorable oh yeah and he said are you sorry for your crime and i said no uh, i would do it again and i was then called back into the judge's chambers and he said i'm going to put you on probation for three years wow. uh, on a series of uh, with a series of conditions the first of which was that i had to go to law school why do you think he why do you think he made he that a condition me. He said that you had a demonstrated propensity to be, I don't remember the exact words, contemptuous of the law. Oh, and so this way you would just be immersed in the law and yes. thereby more respectful of the law. And he said if you choose not to accept the condition, uh, he would put me in the San Diego County Jail for six months. Oh, good Lord. I didn't want to do that. Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> so you enrolled in law school after that? I did. and I Which which law school did you enroll in? Berkeley. Oh, okay. <laughs> you ended up in Berkeley anyway. And he said he didn't think Berkeley was a good environment for me, but he wouldn't <laughs> stand in the way. He said there are bad elements in Berkeley and that he didn't really want me to be involved with those elements. <laughs> oh, wow. But he said, uh, you can go anyway. So I did. Uh, two weeks into law school, I found it a totally ridiculous experience. <laughs> I left, and I sent the judge a letter you saying— You mean before, before actually finishing law, the law Two school? weeks into it. Two weeks into it. I sent him a letter, and I said I thought I would go back into the Ph.D. program. And he sent me a telegram. My students have no idea what a telegram is. <laughs> uh, and the telegram said, you have 48 hours to get back into law school or it would rescind my probation, issue a warrant for my arrest, wow. and impose the six-month sentence. So I went back with enormous reluctance. And, and you I, ultimately finished? I finished. I, I did it. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I passed the bar. I've only done pro bono work. I've done civil rights cases, social justice cases. Uh, I started teaching anyway. <laughs> That's what I've been doing my, my whole life. So how did you make the transition, though, from being a lawyer to getting into, and of course a civil rights activist, uh, into getting to the it, art part of it, Ameri African American well, art? Well, what happened was that uh, I, I taught one course at Golden Gate College. My parents knew the dean of instruction, and one day I was over at my parents. They were living in Berkeley. Okay. And uh, he said he needed a teacher for intro to poli sci, and I said, I can do it. And he said, all right. And I knew, Eric, I knew after the first day I should be doing the teaching. I just knew it. Yeah. And after I did that, uh, I went over to the Department of Rhetoric uh, and at the grand old age of 24, 25, and I said, you should hire me because I can be a good teacher. They probably shouldn't have, but they did. Well, you know, I would disagree with that. I think they should have <laughs> because, uh, as we know now, of course, uh, hindsight's twenty twenty. But you've been you've received accolades for for your teaching. Yeah, I have a really. And good... I have to put this in here real quick that Kelly, my wife, has taken I think literally every class that you taught at UCLA. I can say that with honesty. <laughs> Am I right? I mean, that's yes, and I love it, and I'm good at it. And this is year fifty two of this continuing odyssey. I love it. Years. You know, I I know this. The this sounds really weird but i knew after the first hour at golden gate college the very first hour that this is what i should be doing uh a lot of people so, find that hard to believe but it's absolutely true so wait so at golden gate you were, what were you teaching there intro to poli sci oh okay intro to poli sci and uh, the first book i ever taught was ken kesey's one, one flew over the cuckoo's nest oh my goodness not exactly the standard poli sci material <laughs> i would say not but then, but uh, interesting, nevertheless, yeah. But in the Department of Rhetoric, I started teaching other things. And then four years later, uh, they had a new program called the Division of Interdisciplinary and General Studies. 
And I joined that, and the chair there was a man named Alan Renoir. He was the grandson of Pierre Auguste Renoir. Oh, my God. And the son of uh, uh, the uh, filmmaker Jean Renoir. Wow. And he said, Paul, you're, you're a wonderful teacher, uh, but this is Berkeley, and you have to write a book. And Ruth and I had just gotten married, and I'll never forget. I said, sure, no problem. And I went back at home, and I said to Ruth, I have to write a book. And I said, I don't know how to write a book. I have this idea how to write a book. Uh, and, but then I did. My first book was called The Art of Social Conscience. And it was a, um, it was a history of political and social art. I always loved art. I loved it. I always went to art museums when I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, I sometimes tell this to students, although I'm not sure I should. I say, look, sometimes I skip class in Philadelphia, and I went to the museum, <laughs> went to the Philadelphia Museum of ah. Art. It's a great museum. Yeah. And even in the uh, when I was in the civil rights movement and in Atlanta, they have all those wonderful murals. Oh, uh, yeah. And I loved it. And uh, there was something about African-American art that just resonated with me. It was part of the struggle. Right. Uh, many of these artworks really reflected what we were doing, but it didn't really register with me yet. It was just uh, plenty to see, it was just It was just really interesting, and it kind of was in my mind. Yeah. So the first book I wrote was The Art of Social Conscience, and it was about the history of political and social art, mostly European. So well, it, yeah. was, it was an art-related book, though. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I taught a course on it, and as I was teaching it, I wrote about it. Uh, it was about political and social art. Goya, Daumier, Kitakovitz, um, George Gross, and I was really pleased with it. And then I decided I was going to write a second book about American political art, and I wrote that. But at that point, I realized there was an enormous deficiency. But By the way, in that second book, were there any black artists? Included? Only one. Only one. I think Which I dealt with the Jake Lawrence. Jacob Lawrence, okay. Uh, and it was at that point, this was fateful in my life, absolutely fateful. I was still at Berkeley, and I made a telephone call to the person who changed my life. I think she realizes it. I said, I am not dealing with enough black artists. Uh, and I got on the phone, and I called Samella Lewis. Wow. Because uh, I knew that she was really the dean of African-American art historians. Oh, I knew it. For sure, yeah. And I got on and I said, uh, is this Professor Lewis? And yes. I said, you know, I've written now about political art. I've helped move the needle in art history a little bit, even though there was a lot of resistance. Yeah. Well, there was enormous resistance. Yeah. There were people who really didn't like that I was mucking up art history with political things now how did that show itself by the way were they sending you letters or no nasty notes no or what? but there was i had one graduate student in common uh she was at berkeley and she was at ucla and she came and said that there was a famous professor who said that von blum was destroying art history and and by that by saying that she was basically saying by including these these other these artists, political artists it was just poisoning yeah. the whole thing yes and you know i just wrote an article uh, a couple of months ago i said that Right, history is still survived, and so have I. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But I called Samella, and I said, I really think I need to do more about black artists. They're out there, yeah. and I know a few of them. And I said, I know you're the editor of the International Review of African American Art. African American Art. It was then called Black Arts. Black Quarterly. Arts. Yeah. yeah. And I said, I would like to write about Jacob Lawrence because I know his work. I've seen it all over. Mm -hmm. I said, would that be okay? She said, do it. And I did. I wrote an article years and years ago. My first article on um, African-American art was on Jake Lawrence. And it was published in the Black Arts Quarterly. published Hearts in Quarterly. that, yeah. And I said, this is really interesting. And to fast forward again, uh, after, in 1980, we moved to Los Angeles. The Brockman gallery was still up yeah and i was just kind of roaming all over la mm -hmm. and i went to the brockman gallery i started seeing things start by the way brockman started by uh, alonzo and dale by Davis. alonzo and dale two and, artists as well yeah. yeah and so i just started knowing more and more uh, i started writing about women artists i started meeting people like pat ward williams 
I started meeting, I think I met Betty Sarr. I don't remember the sequence. Oh, of course. It doesn't really uh, so much matter, but Betty Sarr, I mean, that Betty must Betty Sarr been was there. I, I met her. I met all these other people. And, of course, Samella, by the way, she's not only an historian, but she's an artist, too. So did you have a she chance She was the to, first. Did you, did you actually interact yes. with her? Yes. Yeah. You know, when, once I moved from Berkeley uh, to Los Angeles, uh, she was one of the first persons. I went to her house. Uh, through her, then I met Cecil Ferguson. Mm -hmm. uh, I started dealing with uh, other people who had been involved in the political turmoil. Yeah. Uh, John Riddle had uh, not come back yet. He was still in uh, Atlanta. Yeah. But through all of these people, I got a sense of the struggle uh, to make African-American art uh, respectable, to make African-American art viable and to make it part of the scene you know what's so amazing to me though i, I just know that uh, you would think it's because it's arts that uh, it would be an area that wouldn't be as reactionary and uh, conservative and racist as as the rest of society especially during the 60s and before and so forth and even to some extent afterwards but it, it seemed like at the same time it turned out that was the case it was like by admitting blacks could create art it was almost undermining that whole racist theory that uh, you know black people could actually do something um, that's considered sort of a form of higher uh, education and learning. Absolutely, yeah. and I began to see it. Uh, I began to talk to these people, and it dawned on me that I could start both teaching and writing about it. Yeah, and that's what I did. I was by then. Uh, teaching uh, both in the communication, uh, it was then communication studies department. It's now changed its name to plain old communication. At yeah, UCLA. You know. Yes. But I was then teaching also in the African-American studies uh, program. It's now a full-fledged department. Mm -hmm. And I became involved with that uh, when I first did my course on Paul Ropes in American Life. I mean, that was really crucial to uh, my own intellectual um, development. Yeah. Uh, at Berkeley, I was involved in the agitation to create what was then called Black Studies. Yeah. I was really involved in the agitation, and that got me into some political trouble with the university authorities. They resisted it. Uh, they resisted it all over the country, but I didn't care. It was really important to me. And, and what, was, what, what form did that resistance take? Up on? They didn't want it. Uh, the, uh, the, the old white men maybe blunt who ran the university of california did not want ethnic studies uh they just did they, didn't did, want it did they say why or did they just no just they, they didn't, said they didn't want to admit it i guess maybe no, they said this reason. is just a fad uh this is just uh, self-congratulations this is just uh whatever they said uh, this is not serious academic uh activity uh, this is something that will pass. Of course, it's not. I mean, ethnic studies has been around now for a long time. We helped to create it back in 1969, so it's a half century of doing this. But I, I was really involved uh, in a very vigorous way in 1969 at Berkeley mm -hmm. uh, to create it. People went to jail for it. Uh, I remember that. I was on the streets, on the Berkeley campus to do it. And then, uh, interestingly, in my office, I kept a coat and tie so I could go out to Santa Rita prison to get people out of jail and then to go down to the courthouse in Berkeley to get them out on bail. Wow. Uh, I had an incredible life then. I was running around without any sleep. <laughs> I can I, tell. You know. I, mean, I mean, between the studies and the yes. activism, I mean, that, that's pretty... And I did it. Yeah. Uh, but... When I came to UCLA, uh, it dawned on me that I didn't want to be on the sidelines. I wanted to teach in a field that I really helped to create. Now, many people helped to create it. I was just one player of many. Mm -hmm. But I was one player. Right. And I wanted to be part of that uh, in the curriculum. And so what I started with was Paul Robeson. And so I did the course on Paul Robeson. I wrote a book on Paul Robeson, mm -hmm. and that was really important. And then I went up to the uh, the chair, and I said, there has never been a course at UCLA on African-American art. And what was the reaction? I said, good, do it. 
That's fantastic. You and I did it. And I started looking at some of the iconic early figures, Henry Osawa, uh, Tanner. Yes. But even earlier, Bannister, you know, right. all those people. And just imagine the challenges they faced, incidentally. Oh, uh, incredible. I mean, good Lord. Incredible. Yeah. So I, you know, I just hustled every week. Uh, I don't have the energy to do that anymore. Every <laughs> week. But you're, I, but you're still teaching, by the way. I still am teaching. Yeah. Every week I got slides, you know, and they made slides. I mean, I had to get the carousels and put slides in the carousels. My students have no idea what a slide looks like today. Oh, Everything no. is digital. No, exactly. They exactly. have no idea what a slide looks like. <laughs> right. I can remember those days, too. You got the tray, yeah. it's a sure. circular shape. You stick it in there and you uh, do it. I, press the I, button and it advances to the next picture. When I gave presentations, your gallery and uh no. In Santa Monica. Santa Monica. Yeah. I would bring slide trays. I remember. We did it. <laughs> I can recall, yeah. So when was it, by the way, that you met William Pajot? Oh, he was one of the early uh, people I met. Uh, again, I don't recall the specific time, but Bill and I knew each other for 30 years. Uh, and we, when I started doing the research for, uh, even before I did the research for my first book, Resistance, Dignity, and Pride, I did uh, an article or two about Bill himself. We just hit it off. Yeah. Uh, Bill and I just hit it off. We have, the, in some respects, the same kind of personality. He was a salty personality, <laughs> and I just loved it. I just loved the way he talked. Right. I just, just loved it. Yeah. He and I just... It was just a perfect match. Well, he was he was also a central figure in L.A. art for sure, uh, African American art in general. But you know, he was was he working at uh, Golden State Insurance Company when you I met him? I Think he had just retired. He retired in eighty seven, as I recall. He had either was about to retire or just retired. He knew everything, right? And and he, he knew a lot of folks too. I mean, he was friends everybody, with Charles White and so forth. Everybody, and Riddle and all the John Riddle and the rest of them. The stories he told me about Charlie White, just incredible. I had actually had a phone interview with Charlie White uh, shortly before he died. Oh, wow. Uh, Samella, I think, put me in touch with him. And I got to know Ian. I got to know Fran. I was out uh, to their home in Altadena. I got to paw around uh, with all of that stuff. I got to know Ben uh, Horowitz. Yeah. Uh, I got to paw around with who, all of who, that stuff. Ben Horowitz, who was uh, Charles White's dealer in uh, yes. Los Angeles. Yes, in the Heritage, Heritage Gallery. Gallery. Yeah. But when I was out at the Altadena, I could paw around with that. I could see the documents. I could see the letters between... Uh, Charlie White and uh, Paul Robeson. Uh, I was able to assimilate all of this stuff. Is there any one thing, by the way, uh, that must have been very exciting, incidentally, to, to, to be able to do that. Was there anything that stands out uh, above every, everything else when, when you were like looking around and seeing these things with oh. them communicating with one another? Two giants, I mean, Paul Robeson, multi-talented. I saw all these else. letters, um, Paul Robeson. They knew each other. Yeah, friends, uh, huh? I saw these letters and the pictures of Charlie White and the jazz figures. Yeah. It was amazing, just amazing in these pictures. I talked to Fran uh, about how they were both uh, at these summer camps. I mean, these were left-wing camps yeah. uh, about what they were doing. They knew everybody. They knew uh, Belafonte. They knew Pete Seeger. Uh, later in my ropes and book, I interviewed uh, Pete Seeger, uh, and they were all so wonderful. They got me into that community. Wow. Uh, but Bill uh, and uh, and uh, Samella, they helped me into that community. And then when I started writing about uh, these people, they liked what I had to say about them. Uh, and uh, I think for good reason, because I respected what they were doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wrote obviously very positively about them because I think I recognized that these were women and men of extraordinary artistic quality. They were. Right. They did really good work. Mm -hmm. They did quality work. Yeah. I met John Alderbridge. Uh, to him, I think I met Willie Middlebrook. Unfortunately, a lot of these people have passed. Right, like Willie Middlebrook, for instance. Willie, yeah. uh, and John too Riddle. early. Yeah. Uh, John Riddle. And I was, I, when John came back from uh, Atlanta, 
I, he was a font of information. Uh, when he was at uh, the museum, we would just leave for four hours and go across uh, into the park or over to the SC. We would just talk. Well, John, you know, John was, he was the curator at CAM and a wonderful artist, but also just a genuinely good person, I felt. Wonderful person. And we were planning a show, by the way, at the time that he had the fatal yes. um, heart attack, I guess it was. Uh, we were actually planning another exhibit. There were oh. some unfinished pieces that he was yes. working on, unfortunately. I was, I was there the day he began having the chest pains. Yeah. Uh, I told him to go home. I, I know, and he knew things. He was an extraordinary person. I mean, he talked about his influences, about Kovitz, about Ben Sean. Right. Uh, these were people who knew much more than merely the tradition of African-American art, which they also, I must say, knew very well. Yeah. They knew it. Um, and it absolutely deepened my personal uh, historical background. Uh I mean, I've read a lot. I mean, you have all those books uh, right there. <laughs> yeah. I know most of them. I've read those. Um, well, but, and you've written them. Uh, by the way, let's just briefly go over that. You've, you've written actually two books on L.A. Yes. artists. Uh, L.A. African-American artists, I should add. And so uh, what prompted you to go that direction? Like the first one was uh, Resistance, Dignity, and Pride. Am I right? Yes, I knew that uh, we had to go beyond helping them to get shows. I had to at least get something de there on the printed record. I had to do it. Yeah. I had to get this out there so that they would get some kind of uh, scholarly recognition. Yeah. Now, I know that uh, there's a long way to go. I mean, I talked to, for example, John Alderbridge. I remember when he had his exhibition uh, at CAM. Yeah. It was, in the, I guess, the, uh, the mid or late 80s. Uh, and I'd written a review of it, and I said that if he had been a white artist, it would have been uh, not even at CAM. It would have been at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and oh, it would yeah. have been 20 years before. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and uh, all I can do is to get this stuff out there so that future historians will consult it. Yeah. Uh, that's what we have to do. Plus, uh, by the way, you end up, uh, everybody should know that you have a collection of uh, artwork yourself. I, many of these artists you've written about. I love this collection. So you have a, like a personal connection. Yeah, to, I love it. You know, I get up every morning uh, when I uh, come out of the bedroom into our main room. Uh, I have a wall of 12 or 13 uh, works by Bill Peugeot. They're my friends. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to say that, uh, and Kelly uh, took that class. I have an honors collegium course uh, where I do field trips. I mean, I... I've taken people to CAM. I've taken them to Watchtowers. I take them wherever it looks uh, interesting in any given quarter. But the final field trip is to my home. We have a party. And in the middle of the party, I take 40 or 45 minutes and I take them around the house. And I have a lot of works uh, that the artists themselves have given me. Yeah. Uh, I never, ever solicit it. They give them to me. I mean, Dale Davis gave me a wonderful mask. Uh, and just recently, uh, at CAM, I, uh, I lent uh, Lamont Westmoreland, another friend. These are friends. These are not subjects. Yeah. Uh, I uh, lent to Lamont Westmoreland work um, that uh, Vita, um, she rest in peace, um, yeah. used. Uh, and I was talking to Lamont about that at, at some opening, and Lamont said, you can't have an empty space uh, where you're working. And he brought me another piece. Oh, my goodness. Uh, the piece on uh, that has uh, Edmonia Lewis, one of the people I research and that I talk about when I teach. She's such a interesting yes. figure in of herself. I mean, think of, it was at the 19th century, mid-19th century she's active. I mean, Absolutely. Incredible. And I talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in that show, uh, there was a piece on the Black Panther Party, and uh, Tony Scott said, no, don't bother sending it back to me. Send it to Paul. Now, I didn't ask for that. Well, uh, you know, it's probably just a thank you for recognizing them. I mean, just to be recognized and honored is such a wonderful thing. And I think, I think that's, that's, I think, anyway, if I may interject my own interpretation, I think that's their way of just saying thank you. It's fantastic. I feel so wonderfully honored that they would do that. When I got that, it took about two hours to get through the uh, the packing. Uh, 
but I did, yeah. and I have it. It's a wonderful piece. And Ruth said, "There's no room for it." And I always told Ruth, "There's always room for art." <laughs> uh, I can always defy the laws of physics. <laughs> That's good. Spoken like a true collector. <laughs> I, I, I have collectors that uh, collect from the gallery, and they're the same way. They don't. Come, a lot of people say, "Well, you know what? I can't get it because I have no more room." But some of the more passionate collectors will find some kind of way, and they store what they can't show, and they rotate in and out. So that's you have to do that. You make you make adjustments if you're really into you find it. Find room. Yeah, you find room. But that's what I love. That's what I love about you, though, Paul. You have a passion for it. I think that comes through in the way you talk, the way you written about the work, and so forth. There's a, there's a definite passion in there. I love this tradition, and I love the people. I mean, I we go to the openings. We try to go as many openings. I mean, every time we go, we see people like Michael Massenberg. We see these people. I love seeing these people. Yeah, and they love seeing you too. It's by just the way. <laughs> wonderful to see them. Yeah, I mean, wait, was it at the Charles White show or was it at Betty Sarr show that I saw you that time uh, at LACMA? I forgot which, but. It was it's just an example of what you're saying. I think it could have been the Charlie White show. I think it was that Charles was incredible, White. wasn't it? Yeah, I took yeah. my class there, and there were even some Charlie White works uh, that uh, I hadn't seen. It was, for me, it was wonderful. Oh my God, it was uh, great! It and was, I had the good fortune of seeing it while I was in New York at Museum uh, of Modern Art as well. So there were a few pieces there yeah. that weren't at the Academy, LA County Museum, but it was still great to see both. Actually, you know, there was there was a there was a piece there that I've been able to use. Uh, he did a piece on a, a young man named He Man Sweat, uh, who was the lead plaintiff in Sweat versus Painter. Uh, it was an early it was a predecessor to Brown versus Board of Education. Thurgood Marshall took that case, he man sweat, tried to get into the University of Texas Law School, uh, even before Brown, uh, and he won the case because Texas said, no, we have a segregated law school and you can't get in because you're black. Mm -hmm. And so they created something called, it was, uh, maybe a little off, but something called the Texas Law School for Negroes. Oh, wow. And it was in, a, uh, it was in an office building and they had a few law books and a couple of part-time instructors, and the Supreme Court said, that's not good enough. Even under separate but equal, that ain't good enough. Mm -hmm. And they ordered him admitted to the University of Texas Law School. That was in 1950. It was a wonderful portrait of a man sweat. I had never. I had no idea what he looked like. It was a wonderful revelation. What, a, what an interesting thing to say, though, because I, th I don't think a lot of people even know about that. No, I Period. teach it. I teach it. That's awesome. Yeah, I teach it. Do a course called Race, Racism, and the Law. I'm teaching it uh, in the spreng. Uh It's new. Uh, Kelly had already, had already graduated. So. <laughs> well, you know what? Knowing Kelly, she'll probably come back and take the course. With <laughs> so it's a new course. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, so, Paul, let me ask you this, though. How, are you, how, how did you feel when the news hit that Golden State Mutual Insurance Company was going to enter into an agreement with Swan Galleries in New York and auction off uh, what turned out to be a substantial portion of the collection that William Pajot spent so many years putting together. It's, How did you feel? It's devastating. Uh, probably not as devastated as Bill was. He never really disclosed it, but I know how he felt. Well, I mean, good Lord, think about it. I know. He's the one I know. that used his friendships with some of these artists. I know. Because he had a very small budget to add uh, I know. works of art to the collection. And yet he used his uh, his friendships and uh, all those kinds of things to get these pieces. I mean, one of the pieces that I, I, I keep thinking about, it's in my head, I keep seeing it in the lobby, was of Harriet Tubman that Charles White did. The masterpiece. Wasn't it awesome? That masterpiece. It was there in the Charles White exhibition. I saw it. Uh, it was like a long lost friend oh, when I saw it again. I, yeah. And I started uh, my tour of the LACMA here with that one and I explained I explained everything. No, every time I did the Golden State tours, it was a it was a staple of what I was doing in my teaching. Yeah. I started with that. I knew the guard who sat there. Uh, you remember him. At, yeah, at the entrance to the at the entrance yeah. to the Golden State. Uh, there were really three people who really knew that collection. Yeah. Bill, you and I. Right. That was right. it. Right. Uh, it was like the LA's best kept secret. That's right. right. Uh, I must have given, I would say, twenty five or thirty uh, tours of that over yeah. the years. Bill knew it. 
you knew it and I knew it. Every time they had a new PR director, they would call me to instruct the new PR director. Yeah. Um, it, it was a sad day. Though. It was a sad day. Um, I remember it. Uh, I remember it well. Uh, there's still a residue. Oh, yeah. And that's the one good part. I mean, yeah. there's some lots of pieces that are, I yeah. saw actually exhibited at a couple of uh, public libraries yeah. in L.A. Just not, There's a residue, but it's not the same. Not the same because as a complete unit, it would uh, but right. have been nice to still see it. Right. And those murals, uh, Charles Alston right. and Hale Woodruff murals, murals uh, detailing the history of uh, right. African-American contribution to the state of California. Before, it was the state. I mean, that's right. pretty incredible in and of itself. It's like a history lesson. It's still there. And it's still there. Right. That was an interesting problem because the murals were actually painted in New York, uh, shipped, and they were on canvas shipped to LA and then installed. And so the question became, and I'm not sure how it was finally resolved. It must've been resolved in favor of the building. Yes. Is it a integral part of the building and therefore um, belongs to the owner of the building or is it separate? And you know, you could take it off. The, it, I think technically speaking, it'd probably been hard, maybe impossible. I don't know. I guess it's somewhat possible to take it off because it was actually canvas. I know that. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad it's there. I don't know what the final disposition will be. Well, that's the problem. I don't either. And it's funny. I don't know. Are people still able to get into the lobby? Do you know? I don't know. I haven't been there. I drive through there. I Occasionally when I'm driving, I think, should I stop? Well, you uh, know, in, in a way, I've been by there too, and it's almost like uh, it's like a graveyard in a way. I know. There's a sense of, I don't know, I hate to say it like this, but it's a sense of I like death almost. That's how I feel, which is the reason I don't stop. Yeah. And then, and then remember Wendell Collins right around the corner of yes. the fire station? Yes. Even that, you know, just the whole, the whole area. It's like, it's so different. I don't stop. I yeah. mean, the only thing I do stop very occasionally is uh, the fame, the first African-American um, uh, Methodist Episcopal Church. Yeah. But I don't stop there either because Chip Murray isn't the pastor anymore. Right. And I've known Chip, you know, for years. Yeah. So a whole different world. Yeah, yeah, it's sad to say, but <laughs> <laughs> but it's still good to see uh, those shows like that coming to LACMA. It's, you know, one of the things I noticed, and what do you think about this? It does seem to be a greater, shall we say, mainstream museum uh, focus on African-American art. A little S more. Soul of a Nation, for instance. Oh, that was amazing. Wasn't that a great show? That was amazing at the Broad. At the Broad, uh, and uh, it was at Crystal Bridges, believe it or not, yes. before that. But yes. Tate Modern in, in London was instrumental yes. in, in coming making it come yes. together, which is all interesting to me. It's it's great. Now I haven't been to Arkansas yeah. uh, for that, although I've been to Little Rock to give a speech on civil rights. I have a great story about that. Oh, yeah, tell us. Uh, I uh, was invited to speak at Little Rock, and there was a there was maybe a ninety year old woman <clears throat> who said she liked my speech. Well, I'm pretty vigorous when I speak, yeah. and so I do it with my customary vigor. And she said, "There's somebody." I, probably should meet i'm always interested in that and the next day uh when i went to the museum um at central high school which of course is historic with the nine courageous young girls oh, yeah. went uh she said call this number and i did and it was the number for elizabeth eckford she was the one girl who was separated out you know, and she had a horrible white racist mob. Chasing I've seen her. films of that. Yes, it's and just, my heart breaks every time. It is I heartbreaking. See it. She's this innocent girl just yes. simply trying to go to school, and you have people yelling obscenities at her. Yes, and everything. It's just, it's just chilling. And for three or four days before, she and her sister were busy working to make a new dress so she could go to school. It's just heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. So I had the opportunity to talk to her. And what was that like? I mean, you... uh, she talked a little bit about what happened uh, that day in 1957. And, and what, was her, what was her feeling? I mean, she had the she look still of, remembers it. She She's, had the look of fear in her face, she as did. I would have been. I would have been of afraid, course, too. Of course. So it was really important for me to connect with her. I talked to her a little bit about myself having faced white racist mobs mm -hmm. for her is worse but then when i walked when i had to go back to my hotel room uh there was an african-american cab driver and he heard my story from the museum director who watched me and he took me out of the way he took me um 
to the Arkansas State Governor's uh, grounds, and he showed me the statue of the nine Little Rock kids. It's a, it's a sculpture. Oh, wow. It's a wonderful sculpture. So I have it, and I just showed it to my class last Thursday. Oh, no kidding. And, and I what used their, it. What was their reaction? I, well, I gave them the, uh, the story because, you know, I use art to teach history. Yeah, yeah. So I use that. Mm -hmm. So I know that there's the museum. It's, I think, in northwest Arkansas. Yeah. It's not very much on my circuit. Eventually I'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad uh, Soul of a Nation came to the Broad. Oh, yeah. No, that was fantastic. <laughs> yes. Soul of a Nation. And then, as we mentioned, the Charles White Show, which... Uh, was at uh, the Art Institute in Chicago, the Museum right. of Modern Art in New York, uh, L.A. County Museum here. Very prestigious institutions. Uh, and there's more of that to come. So I, we, I was going to ask you, are you optimistic uh, about this kind of thing? Progress is slow but steady. So we'll do, we'll see what we can do. I, we need more. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are younger African-American artists coming, but a lot of the people still in my books unfortunately some of the people have passed on elliot pinkney died oh wow i didn't know that uh, yeah i just was that recent uh, i think at the end of last year oh wow uh, there wasn't much press about it yeah so but many of the people in, uh in creative souls are still around and well speaking of that book by the way uh, tell us a little bit about that book uh, what, what prompted you after all those years of the since the there were not book. there were not enough people in here there were younger uh and and not so young people that i had to deal with and i got as many of them as i could okay uh, and i decided uh, to deal with them people like michael massenberg and yeah. so many of the other ones uh, i had to write about them yeah uh, phoebe beasley i mean she, phoebe is my age so i have to deal with these people yeah. uh so uh, i just I had to get as many of these people. Then Joe Sims unfortunately died. Yeah. So I'm trying to get as many of these people as I possibly can. So when you say getting them, uh, it sounds like you're actually talking directly to them. Yeah. Too, right? Oh, each that's one of, of these. No, each one of these people I spend time with. Each and every one of them. So that's how I'm going to do it. I don't think I have the energy to do another book. Well, that was going to be my next question. I mean, uh, what uh, I. I how long do you see yourself teaching, for example? Oh, I'm going to keep teaching. Okay. Teaching, yes. But doing this kind of an extensive book, I don't think I can do any more of those. I've written five art historical books. Yeah. I think those days are probably done. I'm going to continue to write books, but I think not so much or not. I'll probably do the individual um, articles uh, on art, including, of course, African-American artists. Yes. But I don't think I have the energy to do it. I put together an exhibition called Creative Souls uh, at the Watts Towers Art Center. I mean, all oh, when, every, when was that? That was uh, shortly after I had uh, done the book, shortly after its publication. Oh, okay. So everybody in the book was represented, Yunae Brown and Mark Greenfield, uh, all, uh, you know, um, Dominique Moody, they're all in there. Mm -hmm. Everybody had pieces in there. Uh, Dale yeah. Davis, everybody had a piece or two or three. Oh, wow. How long, Every, how long did the show last? It lasted for oh, maybe two months. Uh, but And Charles Dixon is in it. Yeah. Everybody was in it. Uh, and that's a lot of work yeah. to do it. I mean, uh, Rosie Lee obviously helped. And some of the uh, professional people there you know, helped to assemble it. Um, Nonio Labisi is in it. All these people I've known that I couldn't cover the first time. But I don't think I have the energy for that. Uh, that is something I've got to leave to younger people love to do. It's mean, not like I, mean I curating. Yeah, to curate. Yeah. Uh, it's not like I feel my well, sometimes I do feel my age. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I can't ignore that. Right. I don't think I want to do any major curatorial stuff. Kelly helped me with the Peter Magobani thing yeah. uh, uh, a long time ago. And yeah. then I was the co-curator uh, with uh, with Mark Greenfield uh, on um, Places of Validation. And I may do a little bit of that, uh, but I, I need to kind of conserve my energy for other projects at this point in my life. Oh, I understand. Uh, the major thing that I want to do is to continue to teach. Uh, and I see no end in sight <laughs> to that. This is year 52. Oh, wow. Excellent. Uh, my student evaluations continue to be very strong. Oh, I can easily believe that. 
So I'm not letting up on that. I mean, students obviously continue to like it. They continue to sign up oh, in yeah. droves. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so, I, yeah. More so, the merrier. So are there any uh, young artists that uh, catch your eye now that, uh, let's say, aren't in any of your books? Uh, there's some. I have spent more time with middle-aged and older artists. Uh, I will continue to go to the galleries and see who's younger. Uh, I have a I have a bias for figurative art. Yeah. Um, I like and admire abstract art. Uh, I don't generally write about it because I don't really know what to say about it. Yeah. Um, I like it. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are African American artists who do that. Sam Francis is a good one. I just don't know what to say about his art. Oh yeah, you mean Sam Gilliam? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sam. But Francis Sam Francis is, he's, is he's another a, one. He's another Sam, artist. I'm, but he's I'm a, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was wrong. Sam Gilliam. Sam Gilliam. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's a he's a wonderful artist. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, he's terrific. I just don't know what to say. I couldn't write about him. Right. Uh, you know, there are other ones. Uh, what's the artist at the Cal Arts? Um, conceptual artist. Conceptual. Uh, he was Derek Maddox's uh, teacher. Derek is also in the book. Oh. Uh, I can't recall, actually. Yeah, I can't recall either. Uh, a lot of the you know, highly complex uh, conceptual artists, they're interesting, but I don't write or I can't write about them because I don't, either I don't understand them or I'm not willing, frankly, to put in the kind of cognitive work to do it. <laughs> right. I mean, there's just so much I can do. Well, the abstract art does kind of make you work for it. And then yeah. a lot of times it's an emotion they're trying to get. Right. Convey. I mean, and, and it evokes the emotion. Yeah. It's just that I don't uh, know how to translate that into uh, my verbal agility. And I have the verbal agility. I just can't make the translation. Oh, no, I understand. Oh, it's Charles Gaines. Oh, Charles Gaines. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen his work. Uh, it's interesting. I just wouldn't know what to write about. Yeah. So, no, I understand. You know, so, you know, I have my own limitations. I can live well, with them. But see, that's the thing. I think for, for, for most of us, I mean, we kind of tend to plug into that art that, yes. we, that it relates to us in some way. Right? We connect to it. And it, yes. it makes sense that you would be able to write best about what connects with you. And a lot of the artists about whom I write, uh, especially the African American artists, have. Uh, strong inclinations uh, to deal with issues of race. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they've grown up in this society, they understand racism. Well, see, that's the thing. I think oftentimes uh, it's true to their experience. They're just simply, yes. it's sometimes, I, at least my reading on some of the artists, it's not like they're necessarily making a state. They're basically just relating what it is they had to deal with. Or are currently dealing with, oftentimes, you know, it's like uh, uh, almost memory. They've lived with it. Yeah. Uh, if for no other reason, they've had a harder time getting acceptance in mainstream art circles. Well, there's a book. I, can't, I keep forgetting the title. I'm going to have to dig it up. But the authors of the book once said that one problem. They couldn't. They said they congratulated themselves for looking around for uh, really good black artists, but they simply couldn't find any black artists that were worth writing about. This was in the 60s this book came out. I'm forgetting the author's names, but essentially what they said, the biggest deficiency uh, of black artists was their tendency to produce art about being black. I know, and that is preposterous. Yeah, I mean, it's just amazing that... They would actually, I guess, as honest, they're being honest about it. They're just saying what it is they felt. But it seems insensitive and racist to me to say that. It's a, it's extraordinarily racist. Yeah. Uh, you know, in my first book, uh, I included Lavio Campbell. I included her because she was my student at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And she was one of the very few African-American artists in studio art at UCLA. It's gotten a little better. Uh, but uh, she came into my office once uh, crying because she said, uh, one of the instructors saying, why are you forcing your culture on us? Well, she's black. Uh, and, 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 the, and the key word being forced is it's not yeah, being not, forced. She's, she's not, not forcing, forcing it. anything. She's expressing herself. She's expressing her experiences. Yeah, yeah. People do that. Yeah. We all express, What's wrong with that? Yeah. We all express our experiences. I've been sitting in our conversation expressing my experiences. As it happens, yeah. a lot of my experiences intersect 
with the black community right, right. because of the nature of what I've done throughout my life. Mm -hmm. We express our experiences. Yes. It's what we do. And that's the valuable thing to open up, to just be open to hearing and feeling those experiences. That's what we do. Yeah. Laviel expresses her experiences. Right. People do that. We don't force it on anybody. Right. I don't force, when I don't walk down the street. When I go into Ralph's supermarket, I don't <laughs> grab people and force my experiences. Of course not. But in my classroom, I talk about what I do because people sign up for the classes. Right. We do. It's yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that would be something that's so valuable. Don't you want an honest expression? Yes. I don't want somebody to produce a work of art, for example, just because they think that I might like it. I would, exactly. I would rather them produce something that honestly expresses whatever it is they're trying to say. It's, from my perspective, it's fine for any artist to deal with any topic he or she wants. Yeah. Uh, it's fine uh, from my perspective for any African American artist to deal with any topic. It need not deal with race. That's fine. Yeah. But I remember, and I don't remember the gathering, um, but Samella Lewis was there, and there was some African American somebody i don't remember what his or her was it was he he said well we're in an era of post-black and i remember samilla in a wonderfully quiet way saying i don't think we can ever be post-black <laughs> i remember actually i remember her saying the same thing in a yes. different setting but yes. expressing that same She's feeling absolutely right because in a thousand different ways <laughs> white majority society will remind black people that they're black and that they're different. Yeah. It can be subtle uh, and it's very, very real. My African-American students tell me that every week. Yeah, Just and, tell me that. And you know, the thing I think is, it's, it's actually wonderful. We should celebrate our differences. Of course. I mean, and help to uh, understand each other better by understanding those differences. I think it's a good thing in a way. It's a wonderful thing yeah. that theoretically should make America what it should be. Yeah. It's good. Right. You know, this notion that we should all be colorblind, that's, of course, preposterous. Yeah. It's good that we have different colors. People should celebrate their yeah. differences. Black people should revel in right. their blackness. I have gay students. It's fine to be gay. Yeah. It's good. I want people to revel <laughs> in their difference. Right. That's what is wonderful. Exactly. Live and let live, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know. It's Intolerance is such an ugly thing. And yeah, and hopefully we still see a lot of it. And hopefully we can move past it, but unfortunately, it still rears its ugly head from time to time. That's the reason I'm going to continue to teach, as long as I have the energy to continue to do it. Well, I'm glad, and I think everybody <laughs> should be glad, especially if you're a student at UCLA. You should be very happy. So outside of UCLA, are, are you teaching anywhere else? No, I do the occasional uh, lecture. I, I lecture abroad. I This last summer... Uh, I taught a mini course at the uh, law school at Masaryk University in the Czech Republic. I love uh, doing those gigs. Uh, on Saturday, I did a class uh, for the Osher Group. It's a group of uh, senior uh, citizens who uh, want to keep intellectually alive. So I did a thing on African-American art huh. for them. Um, there were a few African Americans in that group, and I went in and I said basically, "Hi, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, you're old, and I'm old. I'm one of you. So let's continue." <laughs> That's wonderful. And what, and what was the response? Right, they loved it. <laughs> Excellent. Now I know they love what I did. So I do these uh, gigs. I I I gave a talk uh, a week ago today. Uh, at the California African American Museum on voting rights and why they're under attack. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was, as you know, always blunt on what I thought we need to do <laughs> yeah. and uh, why they needed to vote, especially this coming November. It's extremely important, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> it's coming up soon, too. It is. <laughs> <laughs> and we got uh, primaries coming up. We do. That, so. <laughs> Paul, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk with us. I enjoy it enormously. Yeah. It's really my pleasure. Oh, gosh. I consider you a friend as well as a colleague. So Good. It's really, <laughs> it's really great. Terrific. Wonderful thing. Uh, talk Thank you me. very much. <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, that ends another episode of uh, Eric's Perspective. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to the next time. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you. Mm -hmm.